Welcome to Top 100 Most Famous Poems of English Literature. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Number 20. Hope is the Thing with Feathers by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never, in extremity, it asked a crumb of me. Number 19. In Flanders Fields by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae Poem Backstory Composed on May 3, 1915 Lieutenant Colonel John McRae was a Canadian physician who served in the South African War as an artilleryman. He was on his way to Canada when the war began in 1914 and Immediately upon landing he entered the Val Cartier training camp and was commissioned a captain. Later he joined the McGill Hospital Corps and went with it to France, where he rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel, and died in service, January 28, 1918. His poem in Flanders Fields was written on the Flanders front in the spring of 1915. Its inspiration is thus explained by Sergeant Charles E. Bissett of the 19th Battalion, 1st Brigade Canadian Infantry. On the Flanders front in the early spring of 1915, when the war had settled down to trench fighting, two of the most noticeable features of the field were, first, the luxuriant growth of red poppies appearing among the graves of the fallen soldiers, and second, that only one species of bird the larks remained on the field during the fighting. As soon as the cannonading ceased, they would rise in the air, singing. In Flanders fields the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row. That mark our place and in the sky. The larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in flanders fields take up our quarrel with a foe to you from failing hands we throw the torch be yours to hold it high if ye break faith with us who die we shall not sleep though poppies grow in flanders fields number 18 Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge or A Vision in a Dream A Fragment In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree and here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover. A savage place, as holy and enchanted as air beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, amid whose swift half intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail, and mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean, and mid this tumult Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain in the caves. It was a miracle of rare device. A sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw, it was an Abyssinian maid and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song, to such a deep delight twould win me, that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. And all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, Beware! Beware! His flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. If you liked our selection, and want to develop your intellectual skills, or just to relax, please subscribe to our channel, youtube.com, at AI Readers. And follow us, to listen quality poems written by the most famous poets of English literature and read by the most advanced artificial intelligence software. Thank you. Number 17. If. By Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. 
if you can dream, and not make dreams your master, if you can think, and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to, broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose, and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Number 16. Paul Revere's Ride By Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere, on the 18th of April, in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light, one if by land, and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm, for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night, and with muffled or silently rode to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide at her moorings lay the Somerset, British men of war, a phantom ship, with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk, that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend through alley and street wanders and watches, with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms, and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers, marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed the tower of the old north church, by the wooden stairs, with stealthy tread, to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters, that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade, by the trembling ladder, steep and tall, to the highest window in the wall where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath, in the churchyard, lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind, as it went creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour, and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead, for suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away, where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred, with a heavy stride on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now he gazed at the landscape far and near, then, impetuous, stamped the earth, and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old north church, as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. And lo! As he looks, on the belfry's height a glimmer, and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes, till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath, from the pebbles in passing, a spark struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all. And yet, through the gloom and the light the fate of a nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by that steed, in his flight kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic, meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock, and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog, that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock, when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, black and bare, gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock, when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleeding of the flock, and the twitter of birds among the trees, and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadow brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest. 
in the books you have read how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball, from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, and crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance, and not a fear of voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For, born on the night wind of the past, through all our history, to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed, and the midnight message of Paul Revere. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Number 15. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Part 1. Is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stops thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand, there was a ship, quoth he. Hold off. Unhand me, graybeard loon. F soon's his hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye, the wedding guest stood still, and listens like a three years child, the mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone, he cannot choose but hear it, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he. And he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon the wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose is she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong, he struck with his o'ertaking wings, and chased us south along. With sloping masts and dipping prows who pursued with yell and blow still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward bends his head, the ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice, mast high, came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen, nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken. The ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around, it cracked and growled, and roared and howled, like noises as swound. At length did cross an albatross, thorough the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. And a good south wind sprung up behind, the albatross did follow it every day, for food or play, came to the mariner's hollow. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine, whiles all the night, through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus, why looks thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. Part 2. The sun now rose upon the right, out of the sea came he still hid in mist, and on the left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work him woe, for all averred, I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah wretch! said they the bird to slay, that made the breeze to blow. Nor dim nor red, like God's own head, the glorious sun uprist, then all averred, I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. Twas right said they such birds to slay, that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free, we were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, for sad as sad could be, and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun, noon, right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water, everywhere, and all the boards did shrink, water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be, yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in real and rout the death fires danced at night, the water, 
like a witch's oils, burnt green, and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so, nine fathom deep, he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue, through utter drought, was withered at the root, we could not speak, no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young? Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Part 3. There passed a weary time. Each throat was parched, and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time. How glazed each weary eye? When looking westward, I beheld a something in the sky. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist, it moved and moved, and took at last a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape, I wist. And still it neared and neared, as if it dodged a water sprite, plunged and tacked and veered. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could nor laugh nor wail, through utter drought all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried. A sail. A sail! With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, the gape they heard me call, Gramercy. They for joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in. As they were drinking all. See! See! I cried, she tax no more. Hither to work us wheel, without a breeze, without a tide, she steadies with upright keel, the western wave was all a flame. The day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun, when that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. And straight the sun was flecked with bars, heaven's mother send us grace, as if through a dungeon grate he peered with broad and burning face. Alas! thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun, like restless gossamers? Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer, as through a grate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's mate? Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin was as white as leprosy, the nightmare life and death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting dice, the game is done. I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out, at one stride comes the dark, with far heard whisper, or the sea, off shot the spectre bark. We listened and looked sideways up. Fear at my heart, as at a cup, my lifeblood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night, steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white, from the sails the dew did drip, till clomb above the eastern bar the horned moon, with one bright star within the nether tip. One after one by the star dogged moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang, and cursed me with his eye. Four times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan, with heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one by one. The souls did from their bodies fly, they fled to bliss or woe. And every soul, passed me by, but the whiz of my crossbow, Part 4 I fear thee ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand, and thou art long, and lank, and brown, as is the ribbed sea sand. I fear thee and thy glittering eye, and thy skinny hand so brown. Comma fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest. This body dropped not down. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea, and never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. For the many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a thousand thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea, and drew my eyes away, I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven, and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came, and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids, and kept them close, and the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea, and the sea and the sky lay dead like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they, the look with which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide, softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main, like April hoarfrost spread, but where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt all way a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes, they moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. 
Within the shadow of the ship I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh happy living things! No tongue their beauty might declare, a spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware, sure my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free the albatross fell off, and sank like lead into the sea. Part 5 Oh sleep! It is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. To Mary Queen the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven, that slid into my soul. The silly buckets on the deck, that had so long remained, I dreamt that they were filled with dew, and when I awoke, it rained. My lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments all were dank, sure I had drunken in my dreams, and still my body drank. I moved, and could not feel my limbs, I was so light, Almost I thought that I had died in sleep, and was a blessed ghost. And soon I heard a roaring wind, it did not come anear, but with its sound it shook the sails, that were so thin and sear. The upper air burst into life, and a hundred fire flags sheen to and fro they were hurried about, and to and fro and in and out the wan stars danced between. And the coming wind did roar more loud, and the sails did sigh like sedge, and the rain poured down from one black cloud, the moon was its edge. The thick black cloud was cleft, and still the moon was at its side, like water shot from some high crag, the lightning fell with never a jag, a river steep and wide. The loud wind never reached the ship, yet now the ship moved on. Beneath the lightning and the moon the dead men gave a groan. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, nor spake, nor moved their eyes, it had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, Yet never a breeze up blew, the mariners all gone work the ropes, where they were wont to do, they raised their limbs like lifeless tools, we were a ghastly crew, the body of my brother's son stood by me, knee to knee, the body and I pulled at one rope, but he said not to me. I fear thee, ancient mariner, be calm, thou wedding guest, t'was not those souls that fled in pain, which to their course came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. For when it dawned, they dropped their arms, and clustered round the mast, sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths, and from their bodies passed. Around, around, flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun, slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes a dropping from the sky I heard the skylark sing, sometimes all little birds that are, how they seemed to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. And now twas like all instruments, now like a lonely flute, and now it is an angel's song, that makes the heavens be mute. It ceased, yet still the sails made on a pleasant noise till noon, a noise like of a hidden brook in the leafy month of June, that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune. Till noon we quietly sailed on, yet never a breeze did breathe. Slowly and smoothly went the ship, moved onward from beneath. Under the keel nine fathom deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. The sun, right up above the mast, had fixed her to the ocean, but in a minute she gone stir, with a short uneasy motion, backwards and forwards half her length with a short uneasy motion. Then like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound, it flung the blood into my head, and I fell down in a swound. How long in that same fit I lay, I have not to declare, but ere my living life returned, I heard and in my soul discerned two voices in the air. Is it he? Quoth one, is this the man? by him who died on cross, with his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross. The spirit who bideth by himself in the land of mist and snow, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. The other was a softer voice, as soft as honeydew, quoth he, the man hath penance done, and penance more will do. Part 6. First voice but tell me, tell me. Speak again, the soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Second voice still as a slave before his lord, the ocean hath no blast, his great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast. If he may know which way to go, for she guides him smooth or grim. See, brother, see, how graciously she looketh down on him. First voice but why drives on that ship so fast, without or wave or wind? Second voice the air is cut away before, and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly, more high, more high, or we shall be belated, for slow and slow that ship will go, when the mariner's trance is abated. I woke, 
and we were sailing on as in a gentle weather, twas night calm night, the moon was high, the dead men stood together, all stood together on the deck, for a charnel dungeon fitter, all fixed on me their stony eyes, that in the moon did glitter, the pang, the curse, with which they died, had never passed away, I could not draw my eyes from theirs, nor turn them up to pray, and now this spell was snapped, once more I view the ocean green, and looked far forth, yet little saw of what had else been seen, like one, that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows, a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. But soon there breathed a wind on me, nor sound nor motion made, its path was not upon the sea, in ripple or in shade. It raised my hair and fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring, it mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed softly too, sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze, on me alone it blew. Oh! Dream of joy! Is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? We drifted o'er the harbor bar, and I with sobs did pray, Oh let me be awake, my God! Oh let me sleep alway! The harbor bay was clear as glass, so smoothly it was strewn. And on the bay the moonlight lay, and the shadow of the moon, the rock shone bright, the kirk no less, that stands above the rock, the moonlight steeped in silentness the steady weathercock. And the bay was white with silent light, till rising from the same full many shapes, that shadows were, in crimson colors came. A little distance from the prow those crimson shadows were, I turned my eyes upon the deck, O oh Christ! What saw I there? Each course lay flat, lifeless and flat, and, by the holy rood, a man all light, a seraph man, on every course there stood. This seraph band each waved his hand, it was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, each one a lovely light. This seraph band each waved his hand, no voice did they impart, no voice, but oh! The silence sank like music on my heart. But soon I heard the dash of oars, I heard the pilot's cheer, my head was turned perforce away and I saw a boat appear. The pilot and the pilot's boy, I heard them coming fast, dear Lord in heaven. It was a joy the dead men could not blast. I saw a third, I heard his voice, it is the hermit good. He singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul, he'll wash away the albatross's blood. Part 7. This hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears. He loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country. He kneels at morn, noon and eve, he hath a cushion plump, it is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared, I heard them talk, why, this is strange, I trow. Where are those lights so many and fair, that signal made but now? Strained by my faith, the hermit said, and they answered not our cheer. The planks looked warped, and see those sails, how thin they are and sear. I never saw a like to them, unless perchance it were. Brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along, when the ivy tot is heavy with snow, and the owlet whoops to the wolf below, that eats the she-wolf's young. Dear Lord, it hath a fiendish look, the pilot made reply, I am a feared, push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread, it reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound, which sky and ocean smote, like one that hath been seven days drowned my body lay afloat, but swift as dreams, myself I found within the pilot's boat. Upon the whirl, where sank the ship, the boat spun round and round, and all was still, save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit, the holy hermit raised his eyes, and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars the pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ah! Ah! Quoth he, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. And now, all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. Oh shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man! The hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, What manner of man art thou? Forthwith this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. Since then, at an uncertain hour, 
the agony returns until my ghastly tale is told. This heart within me burns. I pass like night, from land to land, I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me, to him my tale I teach. What loud uproar bursts from that door? The wedding guests are there, but in the garden bower the bride and bridemaids singing are, and hark the little vesper bell, which biddeth me to prayer. O oh, wedding guest! This soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea, so lonely t'was, that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me, to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company. To walk together to the kirk, and all together pray, while each to his great father bends old men, and babes, and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell. But this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well, who loveth well both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best all things both great and small, for the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age's horror is gone, and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned, and is of sense forlorn, a sadder and a wiser man, he rose the more and more. If you liked our selection, and want to develop your intellectual skills, or just to relax, please subscribe to our channel youtube.com at AI readers and follow us to listen quality poems written by the most famous poets of English literature and read by the most advanced artificial intelligence software. Thank you. Number 14. I wandered lonely as a cloud by William Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on higher vales and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched a never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay. In such a jocund company, I gazed, gazed, but little thought what wealth a show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills, and dances with the daffodils. Number 13. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. By T. S. Eliot. Se io credesse che mia risposta fosse, a persona che mai tornasse al mondo, questa fiamma staria senza più scosse, ma per ciò che già mai di questo fondo, non torno vivo alcun, si odo il vero, senza tema d'infamia ti rispondo. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go, through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night curled once about the house, and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes, there will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet, there will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions, before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. And it indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair, with a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say, how his hair is growing thin, my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin, do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons, I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? 
And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair, is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table, or wrap about a shawl, and should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves, leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully. Smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers stretched on the floor, here beside you and me. Should I after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter, I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat, and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade de tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile, to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all, if one, settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it, at all. And would it have been worth it, after all, would it have been worthwhile, after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl, and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all, that is not what I meant, at all. No. I am not Prince Hamlet nor was meant to be, am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, are to seen or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers, and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves, blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us, and we drown. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Number 12. Because I Could Not Stop For Death By Emily Dickinson because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me, the carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor, and my leisure too, for his civility. We passed the school where children played, their lessons scarcely done, we passed the fields of gazing grain, we passed the setting sun. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground, the roof was scarcely visible, the cornice but a mound. Since then T is centuries, but each feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Number 11. Casey at the Bat. By Ernest Lawrence Thayer. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville 9 that day, the score stood 4-2 with but one inning more to play. And then when Cooney died at first, and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling fugue up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to that hope which springs eternal in the human breast, they thought if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a Lulu and the latter was a cake, so upon that stricken multitude grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single, to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball, and when the dust had lifted, and men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second and Flynn A hugging third. Then from five thousand throats and more there rose a lusty yell, it rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place, there was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face, and when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat, no stranger in the crowd could doubt twas Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt, five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. 
Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman the ball unheeded sped, that ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches, black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him. Kill the umpire. Shouted some one on the stand, and it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity great Casey's visage shone, he stilled the rising tumult, he bade the game go on, he signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew, but Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, strike two. Fraud. Cried the maddened thousands, and Echo answered fraud, but one scornful look from Casey and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold, they saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip, his teeth are clenched in hate, he pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go, and now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh somewhere in this favored land the sun is shining bright, the band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light, and somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout, but there is no joy in Mudville, mighty Casey has struck out. This was part 9 with the positions from 20 to 11 of our top 100 best poems of English literature. If you liked our selection, and want to develop your intellectual skills, or just to relax, please subscribe to our channel. YouTube.com, at AI Readers. And follow us. To listen quality poems written by the most famous poets of English literature and read by the most advanced artificial intelligence software. Thank you.